Hi everybody, Tim Robertson here. Today I'm releasing an old, old episode, one from 2017. It's where we discuss the uh, Lunar and Planetary Observers training program, a co program that I coordinate. And for those of you that haven't gone back in time and listened to the, some of the earlier episodes, I thought this might be interesting for you. So, hope you enjoy it. Bye. Space, the final frontier of this is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I am Tim Robertson, your host of this podcast, and also the coordinator of the training program within the organization. The Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers is an international organization devoted to the study of the sun, the moon, the planets, asteroids, meteors, and comets. Our goals are to stimulate, coordinate, and generally prom promote the study of these bodies using methods and instruments that are available to the communities of both amateur and professional astronomers. The Association of Lunar Planetary Observers collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar Planetary Observers also lovingly known as the Strolling Astronomer. The Association of Lunar Planetary Observers maintains many individual observing sections and pro programs devoted to the studies of the solar system bodies and phenomenon. Each is managed by one or more coordinators that collect and study submitted observations. You can visit us on the internet at www.alpo-astronomy.com Org. That again, www.alpo-astronomy.org. Now, on to the Observer's Notebook. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Observer's Notebook podcast. Our guest today is Steve Jekis, a past gra gra graduate from the ALPO training program. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Uh, thank you, Tim. Now, Steve, why don't you give everybody a little background about yourself, where you're located, that type of thing? Yes, I'm 55 years old. I live in Virginia, just outside of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, I do a lot of observing in my backyard. Uh, it's a suburban area. Semi-transparency is about 4 to 4.5. Uh, the best I ever recorded uh, in my backyard was probably about 5.8. And a really good night, you can see the faint uh, Milky Way. Uh, so I do um, my observing there. I'm about an hour away from the closest dark um, sky site, so I go there occasionally. Um, I'm an uh, engineer, um, uh, management analyst at work. I work for the federal government doing resource modeling. Uh, for the program, I use a 8-inch uh, Mead Star Finder. Um, I've got other telescopes as well. I do a variety of observing low power, high power. Uh, my interests, um, basically everything. I, I, I like uh, observing in the solar system, stellar observing, deep space objects, do a little spectroscopy, uh, and then other uh, areas of science like chemistry and geology uh, I enjoy too. How long have you been into astronomy? I think from childhood. Yeah, long long time. Um, I I started doing some serious observing um, when I was in high school, um, but there was a gap. Um, mm -hmm. Went off to college. Uh, after that, started a career and family, um, purchased a home. So there's a lot of maintenance uh, involved in home ownership. Uh, so there was a big gap where I really wasn't doing observing and. Um, I got active again uh, in 2012, um, and uh, it was just amazing to see how much the field of astronomy progressed from um, uh, those years, which was late 1970s, uh, mm -hmm. about 1980. Um, so the internet makes connecting with organizations and observing programs very easy. 
it's a lot different than reading from a book and you know applying the knowledge from books to observing that's true what was your very first telescope I had a, and I still have, and I still use it for a lot of uh, observing programs with the Astronomical League. Uh, it's a 60 millimeter Celsi refractor. Yeah, that's a, that's the same type of telescope I used when I was in the training program back in the 70s. So it's, you can do a lot with a little 60 millimeter refractor, you know? You can. It's it's amazing, and uh, I, I uh, really like it. Uh, it's a, a treasure for me today as well. Yeah. Man never forgets his first telescope. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How, what made you join the Association of Lunar Planetary Observers? Well, when I got back involved uh, in astronomy in, in, in 2012, uh, I found through the Internet that there was a lot of observing programs out there. And I certainly took advantage and, and learned a lot from all the Astronomical League, league observing programs. But I also noticed... Um, uh, the website for ALPO, and uh, as I browsed their website, I noticed there was a training program, so I thought that was probably a, a great first step to get involved in the organization and um, branch off into all the different areas uh, for what ALPO uh, offered. So you said you had a, 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 what, a Starliner telescope? or Starfinder. Starfinder telescope. That's 8-inch? That's 8-inch, yep. Yeah, and that's what you used when you got into the training program? Yes. Okay. And you're still using that today? Uh, yes. Um, I've also uh, recently uh, purchased a 13.1-inch uh, Odyssey Dobsonian. Oh. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to maybe using that as well for some of the uh, lunar sketching. Haven't done any sketching with that yet. That was a re recent purchase uh, from uh, Craigslist, and uh, might revisit some of the craters I uh, adopted for the observing program. Yeah, thirteen-inch telescopes, an awful lot of light to be coming in to be looking at the moon too. So I have a, an assortment of filters. So <laughs> okay, good. I'll, good. I'll employ them as well. <laughs> All right. And what areas of interest did you focus on in the tra training program? Uh, when I first started, I, I didn't know what to expect, uh, so. I looked at a lot of different areas of the moon, and and um, uh, and I really didn't know how to sketch when I started with this program. It was basically the equivalent of stick figures, circles, mm -hmm. and, and dark uh, shadows. Um, uh, so, so I tried a few things, and through your guidance, you uh, suggested I focus more on a set of craters that offered a lot of detail. Um, uh, so the uh, four craters I set, settled on was Proclus, Petavius, uh, Tycho, and Arzico. I did those because my viewing is, um, uh, I, my best viewing is with the western and southern skies. So that offers me a good view of the um, crescent moon as it waxes to just over um, half uh, phase. Hmm. So of any given night, um, I couldn't get one crater. I could get the others okay I mean, how much time would you say you spend at the telescope to make during the training program to make an observation uh, as I got better at it um, my observing sessions were at least an hour I think mm -hmm. and still I could have observed more and try to get more detail um, out of the uh, targets um, I think it could have been even maybe um, a couple hours or more on a crater. When you really train your eye to focus on detail and, and you pick up more and more things after um, uh, several sessions, it, it's just incredible the amount uh, uh, of um, detail you can uh, find. And, and these are from craters that if you just look through the telescope casually, you wouldn't think there would be much detail there. You'd see that circle, you see that shadow, and and you'll you'll walk away. There would be nothing uh, else to observe. But when you when you're look really staring at something and you know what to look for, uh, the different tones, um, uh, the um, the type of um, details that are in the crater, uh, the different features, uh, you can really draw a lot out of it. 
That's that's true. Yeah, I I have to laugh because uh, in the years I've ran the training program, most students come in, they say, well, they want to pick something easier to start with and say, well, they want to pick the moon. And I kind of laugh to myself because the moon, I mean, you pick a just one crater, you've got a wealth of detail Ooh. that you can see in that one crater. I mean, if you, if you want an easy object, you know, pick Mars. <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to see is a lot less in detail through a telescope, you know, but the moon I love because most people go into it thinking it's easy, but they learn the most by observing a lunar feature. I mean, you talked about how your eye gets better. What do you mean by that? Uh, it's a little hard to describe. Um, it, uh, even to this day, even though I know how to bring out detail, if I just casually look through an eyepiece, at first glance, you're not seeing anything yet. You have to look at it. You have to... Um, start focusing on it. Um, uh, it's uh, you, as I said. You start seeing some of the different tones. You start seeing some of the features uh, in there, especially as you're drawing and and you're putting that pencil to the uh, paper. Uh, you notice ah, there's one more thing I see, and then another thing, mm -hmm. and then another thing. So you're really focusing in to the actual sections of the crater, and you see more and more and more. Um, and it's just not through one eyepiece. I use the variety of eyepiece, higher magnifications, lower magnification, sometimes different filters. Um, and it's just not zooming in on just one feature. Uh, I recently completed the uh, Galileo Observers uh, program in, in the Astronomical League. And that's one of the... Um, you, you have to observe a, a, a range of targets as Galileo would have seen them, which means under 20 magnification and with a small telescope. So that's where I use my 60 millimeter uh, Celsius recently. Um, and under, under 20 magnification, you get the entire moon disk within the field of view. And as I was looking at it, um, it was just a wealth of information. Um, yeah, I was kind of overwhelmed. Uh, I kind of did a quick scan of the surface, and I thought there was maybe about 500 features, uh, <laughs> details on that half-phase moon. Uh, and if I spent about a minute drawing each thing that I could see, it'd be that I'd be there the entire night. Right. Uh, so I had to, I, I think I spent about an hour on that sketch, but I had to decide how am I going to go about this because I don't have time to do the entire uh, half phase of the moon. So I looked at the uh, the main features, the Mar, the uh, large craters, um, the main patches, uh, and then from there add a little more detail. But I had to decide what not to add. So I'm sure Galileo had the, the same dilemma, what, what to add and what not to add. Um, and, he, and it's not like you can come back tomorrow or next month because you never catch the moon on the same longitude. That's very true. Now, do you think uh, if you would have done this uh, observation prior to being in the trading program, your results would have been different? Uh Oh, yes, because, as I said, when you look through the telescope, I think some of my first submissions to you were essentially stick figures. Mm -hmm. You draw the circle, you, you show where the shadow is, you fill it in, and, and, and that's basically it. You don't worry about any of the ten tones, and as you get good in the observing program, you're going down to uh, half tones, maybe yeah. even quarter tones, um, uh, there's just so much you miss. Um, it's, it's incredible that at the end of the, uh, training, uh, program, you just look back and it's completely different. The initial sketch and the ending sketch. That's, that's um, very true. I mean, that's, I, I that's, uh, that's as the coordinator of the program, that's my joy to see that take place and actually what you're talking about too is the intensity estimates that's what you're talking about with half scales and things like yes. that yes. one of the first yes. things the students do when they come into the training program is they take their pencil set that they buy and they do a zero to ten grayscale showing the graduation from from white all the way to black and how they can illustrate that by shading in with the different pencils to show that and that's mm -hmm. used as a guide when they do their observations later to show the uh, degree, 
the tonal differences on a drawing. And one one thing I look for in a student is when they get to the point where they say, well, it's not a 2 or a 3, it's somewhere in between. Can I make it a 2.5 or can I make it a 3.5? And I'm like, okay, you're on the right path. There's not just 10 scales of the grade at that point. And that's telling me at that point that the student is really starting to see more detail. Yes, and um, as I looked for more detail as well, I just didn't focus inside the crater. I went outside mm -hmm. the crater as well, the surrounding area. And when you have a little more to work with, uh, that's where I was finding that the half uh, tones and quarter tones and the intensity scale were starting to become useful because uh, you've got a greater range of uh, to, to sketch around the uh, crater. Uh, I think when I started the uh, program, um, I probably, I don't want to say I was not uh, aware of um, sketching on the Internet, but it really didn't occur to me to uh, look at a target and then maybe compare it to a sketch on the Internet, uh, maybe a little bit oblivious to, to sketches. Um, if somebody wants to know what a really good sketch looks like, you, you can Google uh, crater sketch a name of a crater and, and sketch and you can see some great artwork on the uh, internet but I didn't do that so that's why I said when I when I went into that and I drew those equivalents of a stick figure it was maybe I didn't know better so through the program um, I, I developed that uh, this is something that um, I don't think you can pick up reading a book you really need someone to coach you and mm -hmm. critique your uh, your sketches uh, every month and, and uh, encourage you to look for that additional uh, information in a sketch. Now, when, when you joined the training program, did you have to come up with a, like an observing plan for, okay, I'm going to observe on these nights and this is what I'm going to focus on? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, my best viewing is in the western and and uh, southern sky, so I would wait until I uh, I, I have the um, waxing crescent uh, right through half phase. Um, as I uh, um, uh, developed a lot of the um, uh, targets, uh, I started to expand my co longitude. So I stayed up a little later at night. Also got up early in the morning before dawn uh, to try to catch them at a, a, a much greater range of longitude. Um, uh, some nights, I, you know, I had to take advantage of every clear night I could get because mm -hmm. sometimes you have um, inclement weather, you couldn't go out. That's the usefulness of having maybe four craters or so. So I miss if I miss the particular longitude, I can. Um, uh, go out and know that there would be uh, another crater that next day. Some craters were more prone to detail than others at different co-longitude. Um, for Petavius, I recall, if you didn't catch it within a very narrow range, um, it would start disappearing from view. Whereas Proclus, a um, uh, very bright crater with uh, rays, um, I found... Uh, on a lot of uh, a full range of longitudes, I could get detail out of it. Um, so that I think Proclus was my favorite crater in that respect. Um, I could go out on any night and I could find something. Uh, it wasn't always noticeable the first time you look at the target, but as you uh, picked its best observing night, you notice ah, I can go beyond that. Um, uh, co longitude and, and get even more. Hmm. When you pull your telescope out now and look at the moon, are these craters you study in the uh, training program one of the first ones you just go check on to make sure they're still there? <laughs> I think so. They're they're like anchors. <laughs> that's the I, that's Sorry. the same. I do the same thing with with the craters I study when I was in the training program too. It's, for, it's it calibrates my eye basically. Yes, it's very good. How long did it take you to graduate? Uh, it took me about a, a year. Mm -hmm. And that's with monthly submissions. And every month, um, I, I believe I might have had at least four submissions or so. Mm -hmm. I would um, strive to have a few. Uh, so every month, uh, you would get maybe, um, you know, a couple craters uh, from me, um, maybe a couple different longitudes. 
Um, and a lot of these uh, craters, uh, they're all in the uh, past issues of uh, the Lunar Observer, which is a free publication by ALPO. And you can take a look at all the past issues and see sketchings uh, from uh, many observers as well as uh, photography. Yeah, and, and talking about graduates of the program, I'd say the average average is a little over a year. You did it in a pretty good time, uh, but the key you showed and the one thing I look for from students is a commitment. It's not easy to do. I mean, I'm not going to prod you for your observations. It has to be something that the student uh, observer is something that they really want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is something uh, that was one of my motivations and uh, uh, what I try to do too is um, um, try to find or think about beforehand what uh, what else could I get out of that crater what could I look hmm. for uh, so I started off with the craters and the obvious features um, I tried, uh, after a while, trying to use different um, uh, filters and see what effect that had. Um, so I said I expanded my co-longitude range. I, um, I began reading about those craters, too. Uh, what else uh, uh, was it about those craters that might be interesting? So I, 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 um, a lot of craters have satellite craters, so I started uh, trying to find them. Uh, some craters um, have associated features like uh, rays from them, and, and Proclus is a good example of that. Um, it, so when you really start reading about a, uh, uh, a crater and, and, and really get involved with it, um, uh, reading up on it is, I think, key as well. What new, can you, what new features can you uh, learn from that crater or observe? That's very good. What what surprised you when you were going through the training program? Uh, well, the biggest surprise uh, as I went through the uh, training program was the uh, uh, perceptual uh, observation ability of the human eye uh, when trained through this program. Um, I went from the very beginning of, of looking at a crater for a few seconds thinking there was nothing else to see uh, and then spending hours uh, sketching it and then not being able to capture everything. Uh, so in, in many respects, I feel that sketching is so, uh, superior to photography in seeing details at similar magnification. Uh, especially, um, essentially, if you uh, don't take this or a similar sketching program, you're really blind to the uh, wealth of details that are in front of you. So it's an incredible shift of uh, mindset. That, I think surprised me the most. Yeah, and one, one thing I've noted uh, in talking to coordinator, coordinators of other sections too, they say when they receive uh, uh, digital images and they'll rec- then they'll receive a drawing from an observer, a lot of times what's more valuable to them is not actually the image, but it's the detailed notes that the observer will make. Um, you'll write certain things on your observing form that maybe highlight different areas of the crater, for, for example. That a lot of times the image is just sent with no background information on it. So it's also uh, the added information that not only the, the drawing that you make, but the additional information and the notations about your actual observation that's important. Uh, yes, that's true. So um, as you know, I just didn't give you the, the sketches. No. Uh, there was a form. I put some uh, notes on it. I found that the space for the notes wasn't enough, so I actually <laughs> sent you a Word document of, yep. <laughs> of what I found. And uh, and a lot of times uh, I found that as I sketch, I was running out of room on the piece of paper or my pencil wasn't fine enough to uh, put that detail in. So I had to say in the notes that, um, you know, I actually saw more and this is what it looked like, but I couldn't actually draw it because mm-hmm. of limitations yeah and that's the thing the observation is, is a lot more than just a drawing it is you know accuracy in the in the date the time your location the scene conditions and also additional information about the feature that you couldn't capture so that's that's good that's that's all part of making a observation not just a drawing what difficulties did you encounter uh during the program and did you get over any of those <laughs> 
Uh, yes, I, I think the greatest difficulty was uh, not knowing what to expect, um, uh, which is why you can't do this program from a, a book. Um, I didn't know where, what my end state would be, and, and as month through month, um, I kind of took what you told me on, on faith that do this and and try to look for that, and uh, all your advice you gave me, um, I think. Um, uh, in the end, I was able to put together, everything fell into place, and you just one day realize, wow, I, I went through a lot, and and I, I really didn't know what to expect in the beginning, and, and uh, so that was the difficult part. You're, you, you've got to um, um, stay with it and um, uh, just believe that as you go through it month for a month, you're going to learn things uh, and that it'll all uh, come together in the end. Yeah, it is a commitment. That's the key. And to stick with it, that's that's the one unfortunate thing that I, a lot of students fall into. They'll, they'll start the program and they'll send me five observations. And, Can I graduate now? I no. <laughs> you still can't calculate universal time. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, it take oh. it does take time. So what are you doing now? What type of observing? Uh, I've done a lot of um, Astronomical League uh, observing programs, um, about 29 uh, programs, mostly Astronomical League, but I've, I've done some with uh, other organizations. Uh, so I want to shift my focus now going forward. I, I want to do more lunar planetary observing and uh, also more radio astronomy. I, I'm active in the uh, SAR, which stands for Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers. Uh, so w one of the things I did this year with the um, ALPO, um, I, I learned to observe Mars properly. And I, I think this sketching program helped me to get those details out of Mars. Uh, up until this year, any time I looked at Mars, it was always a, a pale orange dot. Mm -hmm. I think to the casual eye, that's what it looks like. And uh, so I was determined this year with the uh, apparition of Mars to actually try to see features. I had a big enough telescope, so I collimated it. And um, uh, so as I read up on Mars, I learned there was a certain time um, uh, to uh, view it, uh, that window during the apparition, uh, uh, and uh, to um, uh, what sort of details to bring out uh, in it. So. I started seeing uh, greenish patches on, on Mars, and um, at first I thought, am I imagining these patches, or are they really there? Uh, and, and there's a program on the internet called uh, calsky.com where you can get an apparent view of the object as seen from your location. So I would input the hours, and the uh, image that would come up on the uh, computer program would match my observations so i knew i wasn't imagining uh, imagining uh, green patches i actually saw them oh that's fantastic uh, that's validation of your observation uh yes so um i'm still a long way from some of the more detailed sketches people have submitted uh to mars but uh I, i've got there i could see basic shades and uh shapes and so i hope to get better at it uh in the future Hmm. I'm not real familiar with Sarah. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Uh, uh, yes, they're um, they're a national organization, just like ALPO, and about the same size. Uh, and um, it's amateur radio astronomers. That was another organization I found um, on the internet when I was getting involved back in astronomy in 2012. And I was surprised uh, that amateurs observers like myself and others, could get involved in radio astronomy. Um, and uh, they, have a, uh, they have a couple meetings every year, uh, but the one I go to uh, annually is uh, not too far from me. It's in Green Bank, West Virginia, uh, at the uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And I, I think one of the selling points um, that really certainly got my interest was... Uh, if you join the, uh, if you come to the annual conference, you can get to use the forty-foot telescope, uh, radio telescope. Oh there. my goodness! So uh, and operate it all by ourselves after you get some training on it. So um, I was thrilled about that. And uh, as I got more involved, um, 
uh, different types of opportunities um, opened up as far as um, uh, radio astronomy observing kits and um, <clears throat> access to uh, larger telescopes, 20, uh, 20 meter uh, telescopes and, and what they can do. So the big difference is um, um, you're, you're viewing the night sky um, uh, in radio frequency as, a, as opposed to light and there's lots of different bands of frequencies and you can pick up different things in those um, uh, radio bands um, uh, but opens up more opportunities you can have a cloudy night and still observe mm -hmm. uh, um, radio waves go through the uh, clouds and the atmosphere um, you can um, oh gee you can uh, you can listen to uh, radio storms on Jupiter. There's radio meteors. Mm. Some of the larger telescopes, like the 20 meter, you can pick up the uh, hydrogen um, uh, lines of uh, molecular clouds and uh, pick up galaxies. Uh, very some of the very strong sources: supernova remnants, uh, radio galaxies. So there's a lot you can do um, uh, with it. Um, a lot is on the Sarah website. Uh, one of I'm a um, one of the directors there. They have a, a few directors. Um, one of the things I did um, uh, with, with Sarah, and I'm still developing it, is to model it somewhat along the lines of the ALPO. Um, ALPO has different observing sections, and uh, when I joined Sarah and exploring their website. I noticed they didn't have these sections like like ALPO, so I suggested, and they allowed me to um, start developing it to create sections of um, uh, radio astronomy and, huh. and find coordinators for them. Uh, so there's six sections out there. Um, listeners can go there and look at the different uh, sections and read up on them. I'm uh, also uh, I found five other coordinators, but I'm focusing now in, in the analytical section of, um, of um, Sarah. Hmm. Are, there, are there amateur radio telescopes that you can, kits or something like that that you could build and do your own? Uh, yes, and just like in optical astronomy, um, they're not uh, that expensive. Uh, you can purchase them from maybe about a hundred dollars. Wow. Um, unlike a telescope, which can do everything, an optical scope, um, radio telescopes um, uh, are limited by a number of factors. You, you, uh, the three pieces of a radio telescope are the antenna, and there's all different types of antennas depending on what you want to observe. There's the receiver, so there's a very broad range of, of um, <clears throat> the, the um uh, radio frequencies that you can listen in on. So different type of radio phenomena have specific frequencies that you want to um, hone in on. And then the output, and, and usually that can be the computer screen, but it could be a, a strip chart. Um, uh, it could be the sound. Uh, so there's, uh, on the Sarah website, there are things for um, the different types of kits. Uh, there's like nat natural earth noises. That's called the Inspire program. Uh, there is uh, something called Super SID where uh, you, can, uh, you can record um, solar activity uh, and submit that data to uh, uh, Sanford University. Uh, and um, you can... Um, uh, listen to um, Jupiter's radio storms. That's a Radio Jove kit. There you need a larger antenna, so if you've got a big backyard for that, that's um, that will uh, help you. Hmm. Uh, and there's certain times of of um, there, there's certain uh, times that these storms occur. Um, they're tied to Jupiter's moon Io, so. In a particular place in its orbit, it triggers these um, radio storms. So, yes, there's a lot of different kits, and it just like optical astronomy, it can get very expensive very fast. Oh, my God. That sounds really interesting, though. That's, I, yeah. I, I had not 
been aware of an amateur group that was doing radio astronomy. I'll put and a link to Sarah in the show notes so if people are interested in that, they can click on there and find the organization. Yeah, I think another great uh, tool, I mentioned the 20-meter telescope. That's a 20-meter dish. Mm -hmm. That is a very large professional telescope. Uh, there is something called through the University of North Carolina, it's called SkyNet. And they have a... SkyNet. Um, Skynet. There is a. They oh, offer no. some online classes. The classes are free, although I believe there's about a sixty dollar administrative fee for recording of your, your grades. And, uh, but with, with that class, um, uh, it involves using the twenty meter dish and they give you an account. So once you start that, you can retain your account and you can do. You can um, uh, access this radio telescope remotely. Uh, so it's really incredible. That's, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, power at your fingertips. That's that's a good program. That's that's pretty impressive. Yes. Huh. Is there anything else you'd like to chat about before we wrap this up? Uh, let's see. Um, well, I wouldn't strongly encourage anyone uh, listening to go through the sketching program. Uh, you know, some people might think, well, sketching, it sounds low tech. Maybe it's uninteresting compared to other activities. Um, but, you know, someone has gone through uh, 29 different observing programs. And as an engineer, I always look for new technical challenging things to do. Uh, I still feel the uh, ALPO's training and sketching program was probably one of the most profound and rewarding um, investments I made in observational uh, astronomy and that's not exaggerating it's it's really uh, uh, eye-opening uh, literally well, well Steve I, I want to thank you for that I mean you were definitely a pleasure to have in the training program your commitment and your passion for observing was very obvious from the very start so um, that that is what helped you get through it and you like I said you were a pleasure to have in the program well, thank you how can everybody get a hold of you uh, probably uh, the best way is if you go to the um, SARA site, Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, uh, you can find my email in two locations. Uh, I'm uh, currently a, a director there, so if you go to the officer page, you can uh, find the list of directors and you'll see my email there. Um, or go to the analytical section of uh, SARA, you'll see my name there again and email as the coordinator for that section. Um, I'm pretty active in the group, so um, uh, there, there's a two-year directorship, so uh, there's always got a you new for set. a few years, huh? Uh, uh, yes, there, there's always a new set of directors, and so as people move around and do different things, um, uh, if someone's listening to this uh, uh, podcast a few years from now, uh, you know, just ask any of the officers at Sarah and. Um, if my name's not posted, they'll direct you to me. Okay, that sounds good. Well, Steve, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast, where we discuss the ALPO training program with past student and graduate Steve Jekas. I really appreciate Steve coming on today. If you are interested in joining the ALPO and the training program, the link for both are in the show notes. We upload new episodes of the Observer's Notebook every few weeks. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, and if you do, please rate and review us. I really appreciate it. You can also listen to us on SoundCloud. The link is in the show notes. This podcast is not self-sufficient. We depend on donations from you, our listeners, to keep it alive. You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon. You can donate as little as a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. The link for Patreon, as well as the link for the ALPO, is also in the show notes. You can contact me via email at cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at timrobertson56. You can also find the ALPO on the internet at www.alpo-astronomy.org. You can also find us on Facebook by searching ALPO Astronomy. The ALPO is an international organization devoted to the study of the sun, the moon, planets, meteors, and comets. Our goals are to stimulate, coordinate, and generally promote the study of these bodies using methods and inst instruments that are available to the communities of both amateur and professional astronomers. Until next time, my hope is that you always have clear and steady skies. Thank you for listening.